Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that the debate on artificial sweeteners has been going on for 50 years and it still isn't over. That far back, the FDA in the US said there was no evidence of health hazards from cyclamates, one type of artificial sweetener, but they took it off the market anyway. <laughs> and since then, a bunch of different sweeteners have become ubiquitous in sodas, low calorie yogurts, and more. And a 2014 study in mice said that saccharin alters the gut microbiome. And another study says artificial sweeteners and diet sodas might encourage overeating by interfering with how the brain keeps tabs on calories. Here's why I'm talking about this. When I weighed 300 pounds, I drank five diet sodas a day and I chewed gum that had NutraSweet in it. And since then, Data's come out that shows aspartame actually makes you fat. So think of how evil that business model is. Hey, everyone, you're fat. You need to eat this artificial sweetener that makes you fat. If there ever was a Darth Vader somewhere laughing about a business model, this is that business model. So our family today uses sugar alcohols like xylitol and erythritol, xylitol from hardwood trees, or things like stevia or monk fruit. And we don't like things that are that sweet because our pals have been adjusted. And I would encourage you to just don't eat artificial sweeteners. And sugar itself isn't very good for you. But if you have a choice between fake sugar and sugar, guess what? Sugar is a better choice. And if you have a choice between corn syrup and sugar, sugar is a better choice. But guess what? Sugar is still a terrible choice. So don't do that. All right, I'll get off my high horse because I'm incredibly excited about today's guest. He is a very well-known guy, at least if you are across the pond from where I am here in Canada, in the UK. Tom Watson is a British politician, a member of the parliament, and very well known for his work taking on press intrusion and abuse during the phone hacking scandal and wrote a book about that. So he's got a bit of the computer hacker in him, but just like me, Tom was a little bit overweight and decided in 2017 he was going to turn his life around. So over the course of a year, he lost seven stone in weight, which just so happens to be 98 pounds. So he and I have lost almost exactly the same amount of weight, and he did it relatively quickly. And he announced in September, just a little while ago, that he, <laughs> with diet and exercise, got rid of his type 2 diabetes. It is gone. And he's now in a in a position of authority and power in the U.S. or in the U.K., uh, not in the U.S., but to see how he can fix the food supply in order to stop type two diabetes, which is costing the NHS ten percent of its budget every year. He's sitting here on Skype, looking like a picture of health, not like a guy who was seven stones heavier than he was before. And we're going to talk about how he did it and what it's going to take to get the government to help all of us be a little nicer to each other. Tom, welcome to the show. It's a great honor. Dave, the honor is mine. Uh, I genuinely uh, am incredibly grateful to be talking to you because you've had such an impact on my life. and uh, You've actually sent me in a whole new direction. So I... It, you know, and it's great to be talking to your listeners because I know that they've either been through the experience that we've been through or they're about to, and their lives are transformed, and it's a great feeling. I, I, there's so many places I want to go, but I have to ask you this. What the heck is a stone? I, I worked in Cambridge, <laughs> England, and, and why do you measure stones for how heavy you are? It will, it's irritating <laughs> because you always have to go to Google to convert it to kilograms or pounds because, of course, we've got metric in Europe as well. So uh, it, it, it's 14 pounds. Uh, so I'm now, I've just nudged over 98. I'm, I'm on 102 pounds weight loss now. Wow. And that, and that triggered a thing for me because I've got a rudimentary form of um, social behavior theory that when I hit a new target, I get a new piece of kit for my bike, uh, but at a hundred pounds, I promise myself a new bike. So I'm I'm looking for a good commuter bike as a special present to myself. Well, I would say that's worth a new piece of kit, and you can afford to ride a much heavier bike, and you'll still be faster because you're not carrying all the weight around on your body. <laughs> that's right. Now, 
what caused you to say, I'm going to do something radical uh, like the Bulletproof Diet? Uh, I mean, a, a lot of people, when we're, we're fat, we do the diet sodas or, or try and do something. Did, did you have a, you know, a, a hit rock bottom? Like, like what, what led you to do it? I, I guess I did hit rock bottom. I, you know, I tried um, the usual advice. In fact, my own government gave me on weight loss over about 25 years. I did the low fat diets. I, I, you know, I did calorie counting, all the things that uh, people try. Uh, and I lost a bit of weight and then the, hold it back on again um and then i turned 50 and then i hit 22 stone which was 308 pounds wow. my kids are quite young uh i kept reading biographies of politicians who died in their 50s uh, and so that sort of combination of not wanting to die loving my children and wanting to live for them uh and that kind of deep voice inside uh, finally sort of got me to act. And of course I, I became, I, I was obese. I'd got hypertension. I'd been diagnosed with type two diabetes, which, um, and then immediately like a lot of middle-aged guys went into denial for about two or three years. <laughs> uh, um, but then I, then I knew I had to deal with it and I, I started to read the science of diabetes, uh, and then I came across, um, you, you know, the research that you had sort of read, and I came across you. I came across other sort of people in this field, like um, Dr. Asim Malhotra and Michael Mosley. I, I read the footnotes in their books and read the scientific papers, and and sort of reached a point where I recognised that if I was to do it, I needed to make some. Uh, contradictory decisions and, and go against the advice of the government and then I, quite literally day from day one my life just started to get better and better uh, I mean other than a little bit of sugar withdrawal on days five six and seven that was it the rest is uh, the rest was just a joy what did it do for your hunger levels well I I, I literally was hungry every single day for 30 years yeah. and nearly every hour of every day. I used to fight off hunger pangs. Well, what I thought were hunger pangs, <laughs> what I now know were huge sugar spikes uh, on three hourly intervals. Uh, and um, I had been sort of cutting down sugar before I took a sort of big decision on nutrition and exercise. But still not enough. Uh, you know, sh sugar wants to, sugar such a great drug that he, once you have a small amount you need more um and i woke up after about a week and i wasn't hungry anymore <laughs> I, I literally wasn't hungry anymore and i've not been hungry for 14 months and you know i have my bulletproof coffee uh on waking i have a very good morning ritual uh and i don't think about food until lunchtime and it, it's just fantastic I am grateful that you're saying that because uh, people don't believe it so, sometimes. I would have this constant voice in my head when I was heavy that said, you know, eat the bagel, eat the croissant, the crisp, it, anything. It's if it's in the room, a little candy dish. And, and you just get used to saying no all the time to yourself. Uh, but then when it just turns off, it, it, it at least for me, it, it freed up a lot of extra energy that I could use to do something. And that's one of the reasons I've written books and all, because I wasn't thinking about food all the time. Did, did you find a shift in, in what you did in parliament or a shift in, in what you did in your personal life? Like, did you get the boost in energy like that? It, in all areas of life. Uh, I, I mean, the first, the first manifestation is the unexpected one, which is the mental acuity. Uh, you, you know, the, just the brain fog, as you describe it, just lifted. Uh, and, you know, I'm waking, you know, for 10 years I'd woken up and the first thought is which joints are aching the most this morning. Yeah. Uh, now I wake and think, what's happening today? I'm straight out of bed. Uh, you know, the, the energy, the tank is fuller and it empties slower. Uh, I mean, I'm still middle-aged. I still get tired at the end of the day, but, uh, you, you know, I, I, there's just much more energy. And 
for me, I, I always, I now sort of, I feel sorry for the people that used to work for me before <laughs> I gave up sugar. <laughs> As I, I, I kind of now know that, uh, you know, if I was taking meetings later in the day, my ability to focus and concentrate had gone. And so I used to sort of drift off and in a sort of form of what I used to think was a sort of attention deficit disorder, if I can describe it as that. Yeah. Uh, but that's gone. I, 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 I'm, I'm focused in meetings. I'm calmer. My recall of facts is better. Uh, and I've sort of described it as a sort of, um, a, it, it genuinely feels like greater compassion in the way I interact with people and behave cognitively. Um, so it, it, it's totally different. It, uh, it's transformational. Do you also meditate or, or have a practice like that, a relaxation? I've just, I've just started. Um, I mean, for me, you know, being a politician, I kind of plan this. So sort of my year one sort of program, which is much clearer. I can, I can see, I can plan into the future more. Um, but for me, my focus was weight loss and um, health. To, I wanted to get off my diabetes meds. Um, where I am in sort of year two is I'm sort of trying to improve my sort of physical strength and my mental well-being. So I I have a sort of period of reflection in the morning. I try and protect my my early mornings, which uh, give me just time to think and map out the day. And actually, a couple of weeks ago, I had my first ever session of uh, Iyengar yoga, uh, <laughs> nice. which uh, which was incredibly uplifting and i'm trying to find a way of building that into my program because i think that that will be very beneficial you will get some of the benefits of meditation and breathing and the movement i did it for years as i was forming my program and didn't do it for years with kids and in the last few months or so i've started having a yoga teacher come to my house a couple mornings a week um, yeah. so my wife and i can do it and it does it, it does help the brain some more but, but the reason I ask you that is that you talked about compassion that arose in you uh, when you changed what you ate. And you, you could say that if, if there's a coin, on one side is anger and the other side is compassion. Uh, and I, I now believe that people are actually wired to be compassionate and kind, uh, but that if you eat the wrong stuff or you eat a lot of sugar, a lot of chemicals, you'll pretty much have the angry side of the coin most of the time, and you'll never access the parts of you that are supposed to be that way. Um, do you, does that, does that describe the way you see things now that you've experienced both sides of it? That completely resonates with me. Um, it's like when, when you interact with people, you're, I feel that I'm interacting on a deeper level, uh, uh, and there's there's more emotional stimulus. So I can, you know, their sort of body language, their own sort of the way they emote. I just feel like I can register it more. Uh, and you, I think you just think more deeply. I think you think about where people are coming from more, and you know, you can sort of uh, you just think about them in the way you form your thoughts. So there must be something about sugar. I mean, all the studies on sugar about how it lights up the brain and, uh, you know, I mean, the, the energy expended seeking out your next sugar fix, I think, has something to do with the way we, we, lose, our, we lose the ability to uh, communicate and understand people and each other. I, I remember uh, when I was first getting going on Bulletproof, I came over to London and an investment bank had hired me to teach hedge fund managers how to be smarter, like how to make their brains work better, uh, so that they could get their salespeople in the door to talk to these these billionaire types. And I was talking with an office manager in one of the uh, one of the companies, and I mentioned Bulletproof Coffee, and she called me the next day and she said, "Oh my God, I went through the office and I didn't eat any candy." And and this woman lived in a house with no food, she would not allow herself to have food in the house because her cravings were so strong. So at least she had to walk downstairs, cross the street, and go to the Marks and Spencer 
uh, to pick up a snack. Uh, that was her way of just being able to resist. And she was in tears. And, and she said, do you understand? I didn't eat candy today. And, and it's that level of freedom that I felt myself. That that's one of the things that motivated me to start the blog. And so you felt that compassion and that freedom from craving. But what did all of the other members of the opposition party, your friends and colleagues at work, <laughs> say when you when your personality shifted? Well, first of all, they they I mean, there's a process you go down and, uh, and there's still a fair amount of this now. I mean, people mock you, uh, mock me. <laughs> yeah. uh, firstly, they can't. I, well, if they recognize me, I mean, I, I, I've been an MP for 17 years now and um, I got stopped, stopped on security into the House of Commons last week. And the security <laughs> guard didn't believe I was the guy in the picture in the book, <laughs> um, which caused hilarity. Um, and of course, trying to explain on national television what a bulletproof coffee is and <laughs> how i sort of put you put fats in because it helps with sugar cravings and then and then you try and explain that your brain feels completely different uh they look at you like you're insane um but then afterwards they all say how do you do it do you blend it how much butter do you put in and so <laughs> It feels like, and I, I've got sort of colleagues that are trying it out and reporting that, believe it or not, they're feeling better. Uh, so, you know, you, it, it's such a sort of step change for, for the way people organize their private lives, the way, the, the foods they put in their cupboards, the way they prepare their food, the way they organize their day, the, you know, the way, where they do their purchasing, um, you really have to sort of just really challenge all of those orthodoxies in order to sort of uh, get to the point where you feel this liberation. But when you get there, it's fantastic. And, um, you know, I go to supermarkets now. I just see aisle after aisle of empty calories uh, that, you know, used to form the basis of my former self. And now they're just lost to me. I don't feel attracted to them in any way now. I feel like I'm a reformed sugar addict. And if I have to guard against anything, it, it, it's kind of been over enthusiastic with colleagues because I, I want them to be better. Uh, I want them to be well. I want them to experience the transformation I've had. And um, sometimes you've got to take them on a process quite gently, I think, in order for them to get there. But, uh, you know, they get in there. And, you know, if I could get another 100 UK MPs into the place where I found myself, I genuinely think the country will benefit. I, I think humanity will benefit. And the way we make laws will be improved. Imagine if the leadership of the country felt 20% more energy. <laughs> would you get more done? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, yeah, you definitely would. And you'd, you'd be more productive and you'd be able to set priorities better. And if they experience what I've experienced, they'll be able to sort of think ahead more clearly your sort of strategic sort of uh, thinking improves uh I, just in all areas of life uh, i think we would improve uh which is why and I, you know which is why i feel so passionate about this i feel like i've been given a new mission in life and it's changing the priorities i set in my own sort of policy world did you get angry uh, when I first lost this weight? I, I was mad for for a few years because I felt like I'd been misled. And all the all the years of struggle, like I said, waking up every morning with parts of your body hurting and all that. And and I was like, why did no one tell me this? And I I bought a book that was published the year I was born uh, by a guy named Robert Atkins, the first guy in modern history to talk about ketogenic diets. And his diet would only get you halfway there because he had you eating inflammatory fats, inflammatory proteins. But even then, the knowledge existed when I was born and no doctor ever told me. No government agency ever put this on a map anywhere. And they told me to eat stuff that was literally causing all my problems. And I'm over that anger now. I, I understand what's going on. But did you go through that like, yeah. like frustration, anger period? Oh, yeah. I mean, well, first of all, I needed to understand these remarkable things that were happening to me. Right. Uh, and then when that after that, you know, I still occasionally get spikes of irritation now because, you know, I look at people eat drinking, you know, fizzy drinks, the sugar soda drinks. And I think here is a global industry that are poisoning our children. Uh, and uh, and then you look at where, you know, I look at people lobbying in this space. So we've got a lot of charities that are lobbying to reduce sugar intake. 
and they're arguing for government policy. And I look at them and think, they're all self-editing. They're making limited demands on government because they realize they can only do, they, they've got an incremental view of this. Uh, how do we sort of do education campaigns to allow people to make informed choices? Just stop putting the sugar in the products that yeah. poison people. Uh, and so you find yourself, as a, I find myself frustrated because I just think we need a massive step change. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I got angry. And I, and I, you know, you look back on a life and you think, I, I've, you know, those decades that I was a sugar addict, uh, I could have done so much more. But over time, you lose that because, yeah. you know, you've got more time to do good things. And uh, it's allowed me to make clearer choices in life in the last few months. What are you going to do, it, it, without getting super political on you, but, but what are you going to do? Because you're in a position of leadership where you can actually influence policy way more than uh, someone like me who's outside of government. I can change demand and awareness, but then people have to push on their own uh, on their own leaders. But you're one mm. of the leaders, and, and you felt this. You know how real it is. What are you doing about it? Yeah, well, the first thing, I mean, because you should always try and do good and as much good as you can in the world. And so how do I sort of now do things at scale? The the first thing for me is um, in the UK, we've got 3.7 million people identified as diabetic. 90% of those are type 2 diabetic. And looking at some of the research, I mean, the people you've had on your program, um, you you know, you look at Verta Health, who, who suggests that with the right combination of nutrition and exercise up to 60 percent of people can put their type 2 diabetes into remission firstly i've set up a commission to look at this because it it seems to me that if two million uk citizens with type 2 diabetes can remove themselves from medication and get their lives back control their blood sugars what a huge impact that will be on our country Uh, and so i've set this challenge uh, you, politicians should never set up commissions that they don't know the answer to, right? It's a golden uh, rule <laughs> in politics. I, I've no idea whether this is possible yet. I've taken a big risk, but I want to answer the question, how can we halt the projected rise of type 2 diabetes in the lifetime of one parliament, which is five years? And you will know, Dave, having looked at the figures, the graphs for growth of type 2 diabetes globally are the most frightening, uh, the, the, the arrow goes to vertical in about a decade's time. So I want to do that. Uh, and secondly, and this is still, these are nascent ideas uh, because it takes a bit of time for me to sort of, you know, to formulate how to approach this. But I definitely want to look at food supply and uh, how our food production system has just ended up with everyone living in a sugar economy where people are eating foods that aren't just lacking in good nutrients but are actually actively making them sick. Uh, And that's the bigger challenge. But that is also where there are some very powerful uh, vested interests. And if you look at the academics that are challenging nutrition and orthodoxy throughout the planet, they're the ones that have literally been targeted by some of the big corporations. And I need to understand how all that is going on before I sort of come up with a sort of public plan on that. But I think that's where the only way we're going to sort people's health out is if we look at food supply. As a Silicon Valley disruptive technology guy, I set out when I decided to make products at Bulletproof to disrupt big food. And, and disruption has a, a defined term. It was it was just defined by a Harvard Business School professor named Clayton Christensen, who helped me, helped to guide my career for 20 years when I was a computer hacker. And uh, the idea there is that a small company comes up with a new idea, but the use case is different than what the incumbent, the big companies are thinking about. And then the suddenly that one little idea, uh, people start using it for a little bit more than it was originally planned. And then the big companies wake up one day and go, what just happened to our market share? And uh, we've seen global shortages of grass-fed butter, and we've seen the amount of junk food and the the amount of fizzy sugar water that people are drinking. It's actually going down, or it's not going up as fast, depending on which company you're looking at. And this is the, the the herald of disruption. So I hope that market forces can do this. If 
if even a little bit of government approval says, well, we are now going to allow this, whether or not we encourage it, but at least not actively discourage it, people who have felt the change that you felt, people who've seen you and me fat and thin and say, I want that to happen in my life because I've been struggling for years. I think we're just going to make the companies do it because no one will spend a pound or a dollar on stuff that isn't actually food. How much of this is going to be solved by government? How much is this going to be solved by people just saying, I don't want to feel like crap anymore? Do you have a sense for what percentage? I, I, it's got to be both. I, I mean, the good thing about the UK is we, we can, we can, we're a little bit more, um, generous towards government intervention when there's yeah. a problem uh so you you can do things by regulation um but you also need you're right about consumer power there's a great little campaign i'm getting to i find a council in london southern council you know the the whole i don't know whether i'm sure they do this in in north america um everybody does dry january where they you know they encourage people to give up alcohol for yeah. a month after the, the festivities well, this council in uh, Southwark in London does a thing called Fizz Free February, where they encourage everyone to give up soda, you know, all the pop, we call it, uh, right. sugar drinks for a month, which can basically takes a kilogram of refined sugar out of a diet if you have a can every day. Um, so I'm trying to scale that UK wide. I've just put out, I do this weekly newsletter to uh, my supporters, and I'm trying to get people on the ground to yeah. pass motions at their local council, to talk to schools, to try and get everyone to give it up for a month, which is a very big signal if you can build a campaign like that, that sugar is actually the heart of the problem. Uh, so this February, I'll, maybe I'll let you know at the end of February to see how it goes. But I, I think you can do popular causes like that, mobilize consumers to demand more of their, of their retailers. But government needs to help as well. So, uh, you know, I mean, we've got kids, we've got outsourced companies that sort of sell donuts to kids mid morning in our state schools and, uh, all that's got to stop. It, it does have to stop. And kids are the, the ones where I have the most compassion. I look at how I behaved in, in school and in high school. I was a total jerk in part because let's just say the average 15 year old boy is kind of a jerk by definition because you have hormones that are happening and because you haven't learned a lot of things you're going to learn by the time you're 25. Uh, and, and so this is, even if you're well-fed, you're probably not always behaving in a way that you'll admire when, later in life. But doing it with sugar, I mean, I was a total jerk and I recognize now that that sugar just made me much less able to to modify my emotions and it made me a terrible student, that ADD kind of thing. And, and so I, I look at, at giving sugar to kids, allowing uh, pop machines in schools, handing out donuts and candy bars, and or even allowing them to be sold on campus. It, it is so cruel to someone who's trying to learn. And, and that seems like an area where government has a lot of influence. Is that still, do lobbyists and you know, food, food companies, are, are they that in, ingrained in the UK? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and, and it's deep. It, it, it's iceberg deep. You, you don't know where where they sort of influence and uh, how strong they are. But, you know, we we um, we introduced the sugar levy. Um, the, the, I'm the opposition party. The, the government introduced the sugar levy, which for them is quite a radical thing. And it led to reformulation of uh, a lot of products where they just reduce the sugar content. Uh and over time, I think it would save thousands of lives if you sort of cast forward that. But, but it was only the tiny, it's tiny steps uh, because you know, if you eat one donut, you can't eat donuts in moderation. I know you eat a donut <laughs> at nine a.m., you need another one at midday because you've got a massive sugar craving, and then you'll need one at three o'clock, and then you'll need one at six o'clock. Um, it's a drug. Uh, refined sugar is a drug, and it's. Uh, You've either got, you once you start taking it, you're on a you're on a journey, uh, and there's there's not a lot you can get back from. And and until we have that kind of just approach uh, in, in policy and in the way we sort of run our lives, then uh, we're not going to crack it. If you put on your uh, your ten year from now hat, and some of the things that you're proposing now really take root, 
what do you think the effect on the health of the UK in general would be? Well, um, type 2 diabetes, we have the National Health Service. Uh, type 2 diabetes currently uh, takes up 10% of our National Health Service budget, £10 billion pounds a year. Um, we amputate uh, 120 feet or toes a week as a, redu- as a re- mm-hmm. result of sugar-related illness. Um, if we don't act now, literally our health system will collapse. Uh, the, the, the estimates for a, a decade or so suggest that treating type 2 diabetes will double in cost. Uh, and, w- and that's before you look at all the associated sugar-related illnesses through sort of metabolic syndrome and and possibly dementia and cancer. If you look at type 2 diabetes as a risk factor, I think I wrote about this in Headstrong, uh, it is a, a great amplifier of heart disease, cancer risk, high blood pressure, and Alzheimer's. All of those go up if you have type 2 diabetes. So if you solve that problem, you're taking out probably 20 to 50% of those other conditions as well. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the, the potential benefit, uh, I mean, you know, type 2 diabetes makes family life harder. You know, people, because you can't, you know, you get sleepy, you can't think, you're more intolerant, you kind of, you, you know, so if you can take sugar out and turn your condition around, I think it will just improve not just the physical health of the nation, but just improve well-being at scale it will make us calmer it will make us more generous individuals it will make us more humane and more compassionate uh which is why i see it as my you know changed mission in politics i I see it as a i keep describing my team get worried that i'm about to retire to uh the country and start growing vegetables uh, (laughs) because i describe it as my last mission um it's a mission that I think is sort of a decade or, you know, even longer in, in its timeline because the scale of change required is so great. And I'm only sort of taking tiny steps now. I, you know, I'm still, with my own physical health, it's still work in progress. Uh, but I wanted to prove it to myself before I could go out and talk about the potential benefits to others. Uh, you're Anytime you stand up and, and you, you can show people I've lost a hundred pounds. If that doesn't get their attention, nothing will. And and you're not going to have a good conversation. Do you have advice for political leaders in other countries around the planet based on your experience, uh, losing weight and then starting to look at how do you unravel this problem in, uh, in England? Yeah. I, I, I mean, certainly, uh, I mean, the, the, the rarest commodity in politics is time to read. Uh, you, you know, so you, you actually rely on people to to, to feed you your information uh, when you, certainly when you're in government. I think that we, you know, if political leaders had time to to read some of the research that's come out in the last five or ten years, much of which you sort of amplify on your on you in your channels on your channels, uh, I think they would be more open minded to reviewing how we give public health advice, how we resource uh, health care, um, and how we regulate the food and retail sector, which uh, obviously has so much impact on people's daily lives. Um, and it's beginning to happen. You, you, you know, you look at some of the chain, you know, Amsterdam as a city, their public health people collaborated to get child obesity down by 12.5% in a year and a half. Or in Chile, they, you know, they've gone to town on some of the sort of corporations that basically sell sugar products uh, with the way they do their labeling and their sort of, uh, uh, their sort of designs. So around the world, there are pockets of changing policy, which essentially are related, uh, are tiny responses to, sugar related illness um that if scaled and if sort of looked at internationally i think could have a dramatic impact on the lives of tens of millions of people and and political leaders are beginning you know there are it's beginning to be wedged into the lives of political leaders they're having to address it because 
we can't, you know, we've got a we've got an increasingly ill Western workforce that uh, is making us unproductive and uncompetitive. In my new book, Game Changers, uh, I talked to all the people you've heard on the show and analyzed their answers about what matters most for them to perform better. And of course, food came up as as a high statistical likelihood. So I, I wanted to know what does everyone do to perform better, not just one person. But one of the laws that came out of my book was make sure, is law 25, and it's make sure you're really hungry for food. And there is a sugar addiction, grain addiction, biochemical problems, but there's also people who are eating because they're lonely, because they're traumatized, uh, because they've been abused. How much of the diabetes epidemic that you're experiencing in the UK and frankly that we're experiencing globally, how much of that do you think comes from emotional eating and trauma and loneliness and uh, you know, f- filling in other gaps? That's, you know, that's a really good but very hard question to answer, yeah. Dave. And, it, and it's very hard for me because I've obviously been on a particular journey that is individual to me. Uh, and I very strongly feel that it was a sort of physical addiction to sugar that yeah. led to all sorts of well-being issues for me. Um, but there are people who've had trauma in childhood uh, that um, that I think, uh, you, you know, would, it would the only way they can be weaned off sugar is if you address the cause of the trauma. And actually, in a, in a different bit of the policy territory, I, I've been spending some time looking at gambling addiction in the UK. Yeah. And... and um, we have, you know, our sort of psychiatrists and sort of counsellors um, tell me that, uh, you, you know, for about 75% of uh, their patients, a an off-the-shelf uh, course of talking therapy, a CBT program, can, weed, can get people off gambling addiction. But for the other quarter, there's an underlying course that requires more sort of psychodynamic therapy and needs to sort of get to the cause of the problem. And I suspect the same is probably true with um, with, with food addiction. Uh, and we all know all sorts of, um, you know, from sort of bulimia to all, all the other issues that people have in their relation to food. You know, I think their relationship to food, uh, you know, manifests itself in other causes. But how you can, I mean, I think that you can do the most good most easily is if we get people off sugar and sugar related products and and uh, and at scale if you do that at scale that can have a dramatic impact and allows yeah. us to focus more on where there are sort of deeper traumas uh, leading to abusive relationships with food the the good thing is that even if someone's experiencing that relationship with food when you get them off of sugar the amount of mental energy they get that goes up that can then be applied towards dealing with the trauma goes up and i I had a lot of my own you know, personal development work to do, and I just didn't have the energy to do it when I was obese because my energy was going into making more fat, not into making more thoughts about good things. And I, uh, I know you, you've talked about that compassion that you feel now, and and I, I have also turned that on, but I, I feel like it's kind of cruel to tell someone, hey, work on your relationships with other people and yourself, and here's a donut to power you to do it. it <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it, it, it is, uh, and and it's also, you know, I think when you feel liberated from sugar, as I do, it almost seems patronising to say to people, you know, just stop eating donuts, you know, stay away, <laughs> stay away from it. You know, one will lead you into very bad habits. Um, So one of the things I'm trying to do is is find a language where I'm not kind of lecturing people or hectoring them or feeling that, um, feeling, you know, because I mean, whenever we sort of publish obesity figures in the UK, there's always some idiot politician who says, well, you know, people are just too lazy. Uh, You know, when you look at it, I just look at it and think, the system is completely stacked against people. You know, they don't know what's in their food. They're told to eat this, and it's manifestly bad for them. The marketing is so all pervasive and all powerful. You know, what chance have busy parents got to sort of, you know, get a good nutritional plate and do the right thing? Uh, 
But if you fix all that, which I think is the responsibility of policymakers, yeah. at least to try to fix it, then people then can make rational choices about their lives and live in greater freedom, I think, more sort of intellectual capacity to deal with their own family problems. I would hope that the politicians who call fat people lazy would get voted out of office because having been a fat person, you are a willpower athlete. You have a mirror. You don't need a scale. You know how fat you are. And every time you pick up a piece of food that you don't want to eat and you end up eating it, you have exhausted your willpower telling yourself no until there's a biological level where you say, all right, I'm going to eat it. And it's not a moral failing. It's not a weakness. And it's not being lazy. It's biology, right? And when some person who's probably never been fat, but certainly is a jerk, <laughs> is going to stand there and judge someone who's obese, who's never dealt with it, has never clinically dealt with it, has never been a doctor, never been a nutritionist, at, at that point, they're just unkind. And, and I like to think we don't vote for people like that, but apparently sometimes we do. I'm afraid we do. But, uh, you know, there are uh, a number of obese politicians who judge the obese, and they are the worst form of politician. And uh, I'm going to either try and get them off sugar or get them voted out of office. Uh, that is uh, that is the right approach. And I've seen uh, Mark Hyman, um, who has been on the show several times, a, a dear friend and uh, director of functional medicine at the Cleveland Clinic here in the States, uh, he got the entire board of directors to go on on his diet, which has a lot of similarities. You know, we're, we're both zero sugar, you know, avoid the, the inflammatory grains and things. And he got these doctors, some of whom were fat, <laughs> to uh, to give this a shot. And you know what? Uh, they all felt very different over the course of two weeks. And so it, there may be a role for a, a, a challenge uh, where like, all right, if you think it's about lazy, like let let's 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 have a little bit of a, a public demo. You you show me how easy it is, uh, and I'd love to see a challenge. Say just lose one stone. Come on, <laughs> I lost seven. Come on, I know you can do one. So I, I don't know. I, I know you guys can be pretty tough uh, in the UK uh, in in your debates and all that stuff. So I would encourage you to just challenge them. Hey, I, maybe I just have more willpower than you. I I, I did it. <laughs> Yeah, well, the temptation to gloat is is great, but I, I do resist it. I do resist it. Uh, that that's probably for the best. But man, I would just love to see you just stand up and just say, "Come on, come on, money where your mouth is." <laughs> yeah, it'd be great. But one can always be hopeful. Well, Tom, I, I have to ask what what your biggest concern is uh, in in government. You have this this plan. But but what is the number one thing that could stop the reformation of, of people's food? I, I think the, the global sugar lobby is very powerful. Uh, I suspect that the people who run the corporations that, uh, you know, sort of trick our minds into wanting to eat more with all the sugar reactions that give you a satiety level that isn't high enough but give you a buzz because there's enough sugar in the right places uh, – I suspect they know that uh, the global health crisis is related to the work they have done in producing these products, and they will attempt to buy time in public in the public policy space. Uh, and and so there are the sort of strategies to hold up change. Yeah. Uh, and we saw it when we introduced the sugar levy in the UK. There were all sorts of. Uh, threats about job losses, about lawsuits, about human rights, about sort of government interference, there were political campaigns about the nanny state in taking choice away from consumers. And in the end, the government just did it. And lots of companies cut the sugar down to the level that they would be taxed uh, had they not done so. Um, so we've got, there will be tension in the system in the years ahead. And um, the biggest uh, threat to that is the political will of our elected leaders. Uh, first of all, I think we need to explain the story of sugar and how our lives can be transformed if we reduce that in our daily diets. I think it's really important that people are exposed to the new research and science that comes out every day and has been coming out in the last sort of five or ten years. And then there's no excuse for politicians not to act, and we need sort of a combination of public pressure. And, you know, the people that listen to Bulletproof have 
you know, made these rational choices at depth in their lives. Um, they can help scale this message, uh, but the real fight will be with the global sugar lobby. Um, uh, it will be brutal uh, because some senior executives' livelihoods are under threat uh, and they'll spend a lot of their shareholders' money to protect their position. Uh, yeah. But that's where it's heading. They will do that, and along the way, the more people understand what we're talking about here, the more people read books and, and listen to shows and, and all, they'll simply vote with their dollars uh, or their pounds. Uh, and what will happen is they'll have less money for lobbying because people just don't want to buy it. And that, that in combination with pressure from the government, I think it, this isn't a 25-year problem. I think this is a five to 10-year problem. Maybe I'm a little aggressive. Uh, I certainly haven't been in government, uh, but I, I'm seeing the change. Uh, I'm seeing it on the shelves in grocery stores. I, I'm seeing it with what people want to buy, and I, I've never been more hopeful than in my entire life. I, I hope you are too. Yeah, I'm. I'm hopeful, and you know, I'm hopeful because I've been liberated, uh, and you're helping me with that. Um, I just feel I need to, re, you know, I try and recruit more people to the course and, and, you know, I feel very responsible. I think it almost feels like a duty that now that I've done this to myself, I need to sort of make sure that other people can benefit from it. Um, and picking a fight with, uh, with global corporations. I've done it before. Some people say that I'm a reckless politician. The, the very act of having the fight, I think will be educational to many millions of people. Um, yeah. And that in itself is important. I mean, it's unpleasant when you're in the fight, but uh, you're right, because we do want people to make personal choices, but uh, we need to get the system right for them at the end of the day. Tom, if someone came to you tomorrow and said, you know, based on your career in government and what you've, you know, what you've learned in, in your life outside of government, I want to perform better at everything I do as a human being. Tell me the three most important things you've <laughs> learned. I know you know this question was coming because you've listened to the show. Yeah. And maybe you prepared for it. Three <laughs> most important pieces of advice for a human. I, I, you know, that's such a pressure question, uh, particularly when you're a politician. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I do, obviously I hear, I mean, there's some of your listeners get, st your subjects get stumped when you throw this question. My problem was narrowing it down to three. Ah. And, and you tend to, it tends to focus on, you know, what, what people have learned personally in their lives. Uh, for me, I think you need to retain a curious mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, the, the beauty of serendipitously finding a book because you've been in a conversation with someone and recommends it. Uh, so for example, you, you, you meant, mentioned, uh, uh, Clayton Christensen, uh, earlier, you, you mentioned him on a program about, uh, five weeks ago and I got his book and it's oh, fascinating. Great. Uh, so retain a curiosity because that's how the world solves its problems is one. Uh, and, um, I've got to say, removed refined sugar from your diet in all its forms. Uh, I know that's a physical issue, but um, I just think that will build humanity uh, in all sorts of ways we can't imagine. Um, and the other for me is really to say, if you have one hour a week to do any form of physical exercise, start weight training, uh, because the benefits of slow movement weight training yeah. for me have been transformational the the hormonal changes the brain clarity the, the all the biology behind it is transformational so i know th these are all sorts of health help tips really but uh curiosity sugar and training uh which i've classed in one and then i would say the third one, because I've lumped those last two as one, uh, is always focus on kindness. Try to think about where you can exercise kindness, because I think that in self, that itself is a reinforcing mm. idea that just makes you a better person incrementally. Uh, and I know it's very hard in a busy world, uh, but if you can liberate yourself from sugar, 
if you can be bulletproof, then we can build a kind of world. And that's something we should all aspire to. Wow. I, I love that you called out kindness. I don't think in 500 plus episodes, anyone's just straight up said kindness, but that's what it comes down to. End of the day, the people who are, are kind generally perform a lot better and they like their lives along the way better. So thank you for putting it so succinctly. Uh, good thing you've had some practice putting things succinctly in your political life. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I've actually had practice listening to Bulletproof. I, I, I've been through your entire uh, back catalogue. So, wow. Uh, I, I, and actually, all the people you interview, Dave, I mean, they do exercise kindness. They come on your program because they want to share their intellectual uh, strengths and experiences with others uh, and that i think in itself is a form of uh kindness uh they they give their time uh because they they want the world to be a better place and um you know that's a great aspiration for us all to go for it it is definitely what fuels me i can see that that's what fuels you and uh thank you for doing it for the 17 years you've done it and hopefully the yeah. next 17 or more well what actually fuels me is brain octane oil. But, uh... <laughs> yeah, you and me both. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, Tom, it's been an honor uh, to speak with you today and to hear about your success and to know that Bulletproof has played a, a little role in that. And it, it, it truly warms my heart to see the, the weight you've lost and the energy you've gained uh, because that's why I do what I do. And, and seeing that you've done that and now you can use that to, to help millions of people. Um, there's no no greater leverage that I can think of than that. So thank you. Dave, thank you. And thanks for giving me my brain back. Oh, you got it. <laughs> Take care. Take care. If you like today's episode, you know what to do. Next time you get to vote in the UK, vote for Tom because he's an <laughs> awesome guy. <laughs> and, well, and if you're not in the UK, and or even if you are, and you decided you wanted to pick up a copy of a new book, my new book, Game Changers, is out. And you can pre-order it today. And I'd appreciate it if you ordered it before it hit shelves because that always helps all the book order people know that I'm doing my job right as a New York Times author. And it is worth your time because it distills the answers like the one you just heard from Tom into actionable advice for you. Have a wonderful day.